Okay, let's, uh, we're going to turn our attention now here to talking a little bit more about transport, specifically the introduction of railroads. And I'm going to, we're going to now work our way back to Russia with the, with, what I want you to keep in mind though, these processes that are unfolding in Great Britain, working their way onto the continent. And one of the challenges, of course, that Russia faces in its quest for industrial and technological development are the problems that it, it is entailed with the internal waterways and the transportation systems that we discussed the last time. The principal transport innovation that takes place during the age of industry is the development of steamboats and railroads. Steamboats and railroads. And I talked briefly about Robert Fulton's Claremont the last time we were together. Please keep in mind that neither the steamboat nor the railroad is a standalone device. They are part of broader technological systems that require a whole host of different elements to come together in order for these things to function. They require fuel and raw materials, large amounts of capital. All depend upon ancillary and supporting infrastructures as well as consumers and markets to turn profits for the individuals who own the companies to keep these items uh, in business, to keep these transportation uh, systems functioning. We talked a little bit about the problems entailed in the, in the importation of steamboats to Russia in, in, in the 18 teens, at first under Alexander the, uh, Alexander, uh, the first. Developing overland rail networks in Russia would prove to be even more difficult, as it entailed much greater cost and a much greater degree of complexity. In order to have a functioning railroad, you need, uh, ma you need to manufacture large numbers of engine and rolling stock. You have to lay track across every conceivable type of terrain, build extensive infrastructural support networks, coaling stations, depots, uh, in time, new electric telegraph lines, to support the day-to-day -day operations, again, of a highly complex technological system. For this to work, and for this to have taken place in England and later in the United States, required an advanced industrial base, deep capital reserves. And these were things that most countries, frankly, did not possess. The other thing you need to have is a large body of skilled craftsmen and nascent engineers who can direct the mass manufacture of precise, chemical, uh, pre precise mechanical components and can shepherd new technical devices from the conceptual design and stage to the implementation and commercialization. So steamships and in time railroads are both at the center of a complex new nexus of industry and innovation. And if these two devices, railroads and steamships, are going to function as major engines of economic growth. To build them, you, you're going to need more coal, you're going to need more lumber, you're going to need more iron. It spurs the development of basic industries. It spurs the development of new machine tools. It leads to the development of new techniques which will be adopted or adapted by other industrial enterprises. Mass production, mass production is part of this process of industrialization. In the two countries that really lead the way, the first, of course, is Great Britain. The first is Great Britain. But when it comes to building steamships and railroads, the country that follows along behind Britain is the United States of America. Great Britain and the United States were best able to exploit the transformative potential of new steam technology. Both enjoyed favorable circumstances that most other nations did not possess. They had easy access to abundant supplies of raw materials. The United States, from its interior hinterlands, the British from its expanding overseas empire, where they could bring in coal and lumber and other things if they didn't have it there. Both had well-developed markets, both had ample supplies of skilled technical workers, and both possessed abundant investment capital. The political culture in both countries was amenable to innovation and expansion. Both countries were marked by a general trust between government and industry, and this enabled public and private cooperation and at times, collusion with things like eminent domain, where the, uh, the American government would step in and basically take lands from private owners in order to produce or to, to have a place to lay down rail lines. Well-established legal systems with, uh, with well-regarded property rights, liberal patent laws, which maximize the profits that could be derived from ingenuity. These are going to help condition the American and the British responses. Now, the first railroad, of course, is the one that you see here. The first rail train, first uh, functioning commercial train. It's uh, Robert Stevenson's rocket, which is uh, invented in 1829. Here's a, 
Uh, here it is, parts of it preserved in uh, a, a British museum. This is not the first railroad or the first locomotive engine. It's the first that was built, however, that was intended to serve not simply freight hauling purposes, like those ones that you have at the coal mines. Stevenson's rocket is designed to carry passengers as well. It debuts in 1829, and in 1830, the very first railroad line is opened in Great Britain. It's the Liverpool to Manchester railway line that stretched a whopping 35 miles, 35 miles in length between these two English cities. It was the very first uh, rail line to exclusively use steam power. You had other rail lines that were pulled by horses. This one was not, only steam locomotives. It was also the first all double track line so that you had two lines of track that you see here in the picture, one going in one direction, the other coming from that direction, so you had two-way traffic along the entire here route. It's also the very first line to have signaling. British locomotives are going to be already be well integrated within a well-established canal and turnpike system by 1830, and this is going to combine to form the world's first uh, and most extensive national transportation system. And once the rail lines begin being laid, I mean, the Liverpool-Manchester railway line is the first. But once they begin building rail lines, they, they, they tend not to stop. In 1850, the British are going to go so far as they're going to export their railway production uh, to one of the most consequential construction projects of the 19th century. And that was the effort to, rail, to, to lay a rail network across India, their prized colonial possession in, uh, in, in southern Asia. By 1880, they will have already laid more than 9,000 miles of track across all sorts of difficult terrain. This is going to be the world's fourth largest rail network by the turn of uh, the, uh, the 20th century. So the British are in the process here of expanding relatively rapidly. American accomplishments in railroad construction are in some ways even greater. By 1840, the United States possessed 3,000 miles of track, by 1840. 1840, the United States has 3,000 miles of track. That same year, in all of Europe, there are only 1,800 miles of track. And of those 1,800 miles, all but 200 miles are in Great Britain. So think about that for a second. The United States has already surpassed the British in terms of the amount of track that it's laid in its own country by 1840, within 10 years of the opening of the Liverpool-Manchester Railway. And during the next decade, American companies are going to add new lines at an ever-increasing rate. By 1860, 10 years before this map, by 1860, the United States rail network had expanded to a staggering 30,000 miles. And the railroad boom isn't going to come until after the end of the Civil War. So that by 1869, you have the golden spike uh, driven into the transcontinental railway system which is going to enable you then to travel all the way from New York or, or Boston on the East Coast across the United States uh, to San Francisco and the West Coast. And this is going to lead to the rapid population of the West by white settlers. You're going to see a, a four and a half times increase in white settlement from about, I want to say it's about two million or so in uh, 1840, 1850 to about 8.5, 9 million uh, by 1880. All these white folks coming from the east, settling in the west, and then what ends up happening is we end up backfilling the country into all of these lands that are sparsely populated by indigenous uh, Indian tribes. Yes, sir. Did you ever read about that railway that had two trains they were putting out a commission, and as a publicity stunt, they ran them into each other at full speed? No. <laughs> I heard that. Yeah, they actually did that, and they forgot the boilers tend to explode. Yes, they do. And ended up killing about 50 people in the crowd. Oh, my God. It didn't work out real well for their PR department. Well, if you can, if you can find that, you find that story, yeah, send I'll, it to if me. If I find it, I'll send it to you. Oh, man, bad ideas, huh? So this is, this is what's transpiring in the uh, you know, 1820, 18, 1830, 1840, 1850. This is, again, the backdrop of what's going on in Britain and the United States during the first half of, of the 19th century. Okay, now I haven't said anything. We've been here uh, well over an hour, an uh, hour and a half. I haven't said a thing about Russia today. Yeah, that's, that's partially by design. 
because what we're going to be talking about the rest of today, all of next week, all of the week after that, and honestly for the rest of the semester, in many respects, is the Russian response to this, European industrialization. How are the Russians going to deal with this incredibly dynamic, productive, but also costly process that's unfolding, and one that's unfolding with a great deal of internal social and political unrest? That's going to come from those folks who are being displaced by the factories, who are losing their livelihoods, who are, being con who are congregating into these large urban centers. The individual who is going to have uh, the principal response of trying to, to organize all of these rapid changes in the first half of the 19th century for the Russians is the new autocrat, Nicholas I. Nicholas I, younger brother of the now deceased Alexander I, Nicholas had been born in 1796 as the third son of Paul. His older brother Constantine is the one who is going to uh, abdicate. He's going to uh, refuse to take the throne following Alexander's death. Nicholas is uh, sort of typical, I suppose, of our now or 19th century male Russian autocrats. Um, he had learned to speak French, German, and English as a young man. He also uh, studied Latin and Greek. He was fond of drawing, he played the flute, he patronized opera, the ballet, drama, and fancy dress balls. He liked all that sort of thing. His education had been overseen by distinguished scholars of political economy, of government, of jurisprudence, and public finances. He was an educated man. He, he really was. But he had little interest in many of these subjects. You, you can, you know, you can bring education to an individual. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to exercise that education um, and, and, and embrace liberal learning. At a very early age, he developed an aversion to what he called abstractions, legal notions, theoretical ideas. These remained largely foreign to his mindset. Although educated, he could be very narrow-minded, very conservative, to the point of being obscurantist. There were certain things he simply wanted no part of. His theory of governance, his theory of rule, could be summed up in the following quote. This is Nicholas speaking. Sound morals are the best theory of law. They must be present in the heart of every man, irrespective of any abstraction, and must be based on religion. The one thing that he did have an abiding fascination with was all things military, not unlike Alexander, his older brother, not unlike his father, Paul I. He loved military science. He loved a good military parade. He also showed a considerable degree of aptitude for what we would call military engineering, and he would be trained for a time as an engineer. He joined the Russian army abroad in 1814. He had traveled extensively in Russia. He traveled extensively abroad. And he developed a love of order, drill, and the parade ground. He would marry Princess Charlotte of Prussia. She was the daughter of Frederick Wilhelm III, a future sister, or sister of the future king, Frederick Wilhelm IV. Um, during, his, uh, during his young adulthood, Nicholas took no part in the administrative affairs of the state. He had no public role under Alexander I. He commanded a guards brigade, and he served as inspector general of, of army engineers. So it's not as if he's actively involved in, in shaping policy or in influencing court life in the 18-teens or in the first half of the 1820s. His political philosophy can be summed up, uh, it actually is going to be summed up as we're going to find out here in a second in a very famous formula, but he was absolutely a firm believer in autocracy. He believed the sovereign ruled by the grace of God and that the autocrat was both the fountain of law and the actual head of the administration of the entire state. He emphasized the importance of dynastic and religious factors, stressed the notion of duty and discipline, and insisted upon strict conformity among his subjects to national tradition. He visualized the state and he visualized society as functioning like a well-drilled army unit. It was a polity that embodied the principles of hierarchical subordination with a close 
delineation of each member's duties. But above all of this was the unchallengeable authority, the unquestioned rule of God's anointed leader, him, czar of all the Russias. The entire life of a man must be regarded merely as service, for everybody has to serve. That's also Nicholas. His act of service, of course, was to serve a czar, but all those below him would be expected to serve the state, which was embodied in Nicholas himself. Now, what is curious about Russia by the time Nicholas ascends to the throne in 1825 is that Russia has finally emerged as a full-fledged member of the European state of nations. But, Europe, but Russia in 1825 was a European state of the sort that was rapidly beginning to disappear in Europe. It was an absolutist monarchy. An absolutist monarchy by 1825 that was very much uh, along the lines of the absolutist monarchy of, say, Louis XIV, Louis XIV to France. It's almost as if Russia, having caught up to Europe, has discovered that Europe now has moved forward into something else. It's moving forward into a more kind of representative democratic uh, political process that's been unleashed by the forces of the French Revolution and being exacerbated by the forces of the Industrial Revolution, where those old socialist states, those old hierarchies of that old absolutist order are being broken down by the spread of industry and the changing relationships of individuals within the country to their political leaders. In other words, Russia was a European state, but a European state of a Europe that had existed a half a decade or half, half a century earlier. So whereas they were kind of turned off by those ideas after the French Revolution, everybody else kind of went with them? Sure, and, we're, and, this, this is, and, and Nicholas I is the one who's going to have to struggle to resolve this. And he's going to struggle to resolve this, and ultimately he's not going to be able to do that. But yeah, he's, he's fighting against those ideas of Republican constitutions and greater autonomy for individuals and greater, diplom uh, greater uh, democratic institutions or checks on, on autocratic power. He wants none of that. He wants to rule Russia after the fashion of Louis XIV, and he's doing this after Louis XVI has lost his head. So Russia is going to stand as a bulwark under Nicholas I against the spread of Republican and democratic ideas. Did that have anything to do Part of it does. There's a real rejection of French cultural traditions in the wake of the, of the Napoleonic invasion. And I mentioned this briefly. We're going to come back to it in about a week or so. What the Russians had done under Catherine, especially, is they had grown to really adopt French language and customs. They looked to the French for intellectual ideas. They looked to the French for cultural trends. In the aftermath of the Napoleonic invasion, they're turning inward and they're saying, wait a second. We're Russians. There's nothing wrong with being a Russian. And they begin emphasizing more nationalistic elements. Nicholas is going to embrace that fully. He's going to embrace that fully, rejecting the idea that the Russians should be aping or copying the West. Although, we're going to find out, he comes to recognize there are aspects of the West that Russia needs, the technological innovations. But how do you bring about the technological innovations? That's what I want you to think about. That's why I talked about the British and the American examples. Liberal patent law, cooperation between private entrepreneurs and members of the educated scientific classes, cooperation between corporations and government entities, those types of things, those are absent in the Russia of Nicholas I. So how you're going to replicate that British model is going to be a real problem. Do you even want to replicate that British model? We're going to come to that discussion next time that we meet. So the Tsar continues to exercise immense personal influence. His position is bolstered by the military and by the state bureaucracy. The land-owning uh, gentry officers are going to lend the autocracy support as well, they serve as, as most of the armed forces. They have almost complete control over the population uh, in the provinces, in part because they own much of the population in the form of serfs, right, uh, bound to the land. The landowning uh, gentry officers, however, like the state bureaucrats, serve not their own interests, their own corporate interests. They serve instead the interests of the state, as embodied in the autocrat Nicholas I. There are no institutions in Russia in the 1820s or the 1830s that can successfully challenge autocratic prerogative. Private guilds, unions, professional organizations, like that free society uh, that I talked about in England, these really don't exist. There's no independent property to elements with economic wherewithal to threaten absolutism. The press, to the extent that it exists, is very small and weak. 
There's nothing in Russia like the Republic of Letters. Uh, the journalists, the newsmen, the lawyers who wrote pamphlets um, as French revolutionaries um, or as members of the Sons of Liberty in the United States, that proto-revolutionary group of, of pamphleteers and journalists like Thomas Paine who would spread revolutionary unrest among the colonies, resulting in uh, the American Revolution in 1776. 1825, you don't have this in Russia. And we're already now 40 to 50 years after the fact. And Nicholas is going to stand athwart against these kinds of, uh, this kind of progress. We've already seen, however, that in Russia, the autocracy could serve, and the state in general could serve, as a, as a very important agent of change. The impetus, the initiative for change, typically came from above. We saw that with Ivan III. We saw that with Ivan IV. More recently, with Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. It appears on the surface that Russia under Nicholas I, in those circumstances, the state seemed to act more frequently as a break, as a hindrance to further change or progress. Part of this has to do with the ways in which or the circumstances in which uh, Nicholas I had come to power. His coronation, uh, to the, or not his coronation, his ascension to the throne had been marred by the Decemberist revolt of 14 December 1825. Those young, uh, army, uh, guard, those young army officers who had experienced Europe during the, the Napoleonic invasion had come back to Russia and begun plotting to establish a new form of government. Their revolt in December of 1825, deeply haunted Nicholas I. He was disturbed above all by the fact that the conspiracy had centered on noble officers, nobles, who should have been loyal to their sovereign. He was concerned at the same time by the political and social discontent that was now roiling increasingly the European continent, and he feared that European revolutionary sentiment would spread to Russia. What he aimed to do from very early on in his reign was to check any domestic dissent by using repression and surveillance. I mentioned this at the, at the conclusion of, of, of last week's meeting. After coming to the throne, he expands greatly the power of the existing gendarmerie. That's a uniform police service that had been established by Alexander I. And he introduces a strict censorship code that's going to be overseen by the bureaucracy to track public opinion. In 1826, he creates something known as the Third Section. The Third Section is a secret police force that is entrusted with gathering political intelligence and suppressing dissent. Unique among European institutions, because there are other secret police forces. Napoleon Bonaparte creates one. Napoleon is going to create one. The Prussians are going to have one. What's unique about the Third Section in Russia is that the Russian secret police was empowered to detain and even to exile even those simply suspected of political crimes. In France or in Prussia, you were at least entitled to a trial. In Russia, no. This isn't Prussia, this isn't France. If you're suspected of a political crime, you could be exiled, ultimately on the authority of the autocrat. Uh, through, you know, it's, it's the third section is, is, is is, 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 is undertaking or is serving the will of the autocrat. 1826, the same year that he establishes a third section, he introduces as well a new censorship law. The new censorship law was designed to direct public opinion, this is a quote, it's designed to direct public opinion into agreeing with present political circumstances and the views of the government. The, the law is designed to direct public opinion into agreeing with present circumstances and the views of the government. The censorship law is designed to get the press, such as it exists, to tow the government's line. Authors, editors, and publishers under this new law were required to submit in advance anything they wanted to publish. It had to be pre-approved by state censors. The Tsar reserved the right to personally approve or to reject licenses to establish private periodicals. In other words, you could not establish a newspaper, you could not establish uh, a journal unless you had the Tsar's personal signature. Or at least he reserved the right. He reserved the right to sign off on any new publishing venture. <clears throat> 
ideas behind autocracy, his ideas behind governance, are going to be pithily summarized in 1833 by his minister of finance, a fellow by the name of uh, Sergei Uvarov. Uvarov would write that his goal for the Tsar's subjects was to ensure that all subjects being permeated by one and the same feeling of devotion to throne and the fatherland will use their resources to become worthy tools of the government and to earn his complete confidence. What the education minister believed was that educational institutions existed to create individuals to serve the state. Now, if that sounds familiar, it should. That was Peter's idea behind education. You receive your education in order to serve the state, in order to serve the autocrat. You don't receive your education to become a free-thinking individual. His goal was to ensure that all subjects would um, use their education to serve the state. None of that critical thinking crap. We don't want you becoming critical thinkers. We want you to become good, educated state servitors who will put their knowledge and skills, knowledge and skills, uh, to useful purposes the state uh, uh, can uh, draw upon. Another one of the things that he's he's well known for saying is that he wanted to avoid the emergence of university Pugachevs. In other words, like the, our, our rebel under Catherine II, he doesn't want rebels emerging out of uh, the university students. He doesn't, want the, he doesn't want them trying to raise the rabble. The impact on all of this would come to be, I should say, the, uh, the slogan that he would develop, the slogan that uh, the education minister would develop, that would come to define Nicholas's reign until Nicholas passes from the scene in 1855, is orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. These are the three foundations upon which Nicholas I is going to base his reign. Orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. Devotion to the church, devotion to the state, and an awareness of the central role played, because when we say nationality, we mean specifically Russian nationality. The impact that uh, Uvarov is going to have on education is to impose upon university students strict new codes comparable to military discipline. The university students are going to be uniformed. They're going to mandatory wearing of uniforms to identify students when they're out and about in, the, in, the, in town. They're required uh, to undergo participation in drill and their instructors at university are expected to keep watch over them and to punish them appropriately if they get out of line. You could be fined for improper dress. You could be fined if your hair was too long. And the other thing that the ministry is going to undertake is to restrict enrollment in universities to prevent the student body from becoming unmanageably large. You also want to limit access to university education to nobles only, nobles only. There's this abiding sense that only nobles are going to act responsibly with this education. Philosophy and constitutional law are going to be banned as university subjects. You cannot teach those things. The ministry is going to no longer send young men abroad to prepare for university professorships. And limitations are going to be imposed on the acquisition of foreign books by university libraries. This sort of harkens by, back to things that we saw under Paul I, restricting mathematical and music books because he thought that there were formula uh, in the mathematical, or he thought there were secret codes in the mathematical formula of the musical notations. What this is, is an attempt to wall off Russia from the contagion of revolutionary ideas that are percolating in Central and Western Europe. We've already seen these revolutionary ideas infect um, and upset the minds of those Decemberist revolutionaries. What Nicholas wants to do is to prevent them from affecting greater and greater numbers of Russians. What's curious, however, is that Nicholas's reign, despite his justified reputation for being an arch conservative and a reactionary, Nicholas's reign actually sees important reforms undertaken in two fields that are going to be critical to Russia's later development. 
technical education in the periodical press. Technical education in, peri in the periodical, uh, periodical press. Two things, incidentally, that, were, that uh, received a great deal of attention in government funding under Peter I. The mathematical schools, the navigational schools, the founding for all intended purposes of the secular print, print revolution, Nicholas I is following along after the model of Peter in this regard. And like Peter, he's being motivated not by a desire to create critically thinking subjects. No. He's motivated by a desire to create cadres of future state workers, future state workers, who will develop the skills and abilities that the state needs in order for it to modernize, right, to challenge then uh, Western uh, European nations. Under Nicholas I, the autocracy would demonstrate a willingness to expand and reform the empire's educational institutions to meet the state's evolving military and economic needs. You may recall last week I mentioned that Nicholas's elder brother, Alexander I, had established, for example, the Institute for Transportation Engineers in 1810 as a way of trying to improve transportation. Alexander also reorganizes the existing mining institute. He places new emphasis on training in sciences and the so-called mechanical arts. Nicholas I is going to follow that policy. Again, following Alexander I, following Peter I, to create adequate numbers of individuals trained with skills usable to the state. St. Petersburg State University, shown here, um, and this is the, one of the original building, the 12 Colleges building. It was in this building that Peter the Great had first created his administrative college, colleges. This is going to be given over to St. Petersburg State University, which was established in 1819. A school of architecture will be established in 1830. Two years later, a school for civil engineers will be established. These will be merged in 1842 into something known as a school for construction. The purpose of establishing these new institutions was to train native specialists, Russians, in the building of roads and bridges and dams. Nicholas I oversees the establishment of an agricultural school in 1836 to provide basic training in agricultural management and agronomy. A main engineering school um, had been founded in St. Petersburg in 1816 under Alexander I. This was the very first institution in Russia that trained military engineers. This is following on things that are, being, that are, that are unfolding in the West. The French are going to lead the way in the 1790s with the establishment of the first engineering schools and universities. But it's the United States that's really going to see this expand greatly in the first half of the 19th century. One of the most important early engineering schools is West Point. The, the, uh, the United States a Military Academy at West Point, which is designed to train army officers and among the tasks of army officers in the 19th century in the United States, one of the most important things that they undertook were engineering duties. There's something that they need topographical engineers. And when they retired from the army, after they had served their commission, they would go out into, into the public and they would help build roads and bridges and dams and later railroads. Army engineers are going to play a very important role in that regard. So what Nicholas I is doing, what Alexander I had done before him, is not at all that unusual following along here what the, the British, the French, and the Americans are doing. In 1827, something known as the Emperor Nicholas I Naval Technical School is established. This offers advanced training in technology and the sciences to students in the Naval Cadet Corps. Think here sort of like uh, Annapolis, right? the United States uh, uh, Naval Academy. A new artillery school emerges in 1830. By 1854, the year before Nicholas I dies. By 1854, there are more than 16,000 students enrolled in, more than 20, enrolled in 22 separate cadet schools across the empire. And they're being trained here largely in technical and mechanical subjects. 1828 sees the establishment of something known as the State Institute of Technology in St. Petersburg. It's this building right here. Obviously, the picture's taken later. We don't have photographs yet in 1828, so it comes a little bit later. The St. Petersburg Practical Technical Institute, as it's also known, was arguably the most innovative of all the new educational establishments established during Nicholas's reign. 
It was designed to train supervisors and technicians for Russia's emerging factories. Not a lot of them yet, but they are beginning to emerge. The curriculum emphasized pragmatic education. The results were admittedly a bit disappointing. Between 1837 and 1843, there would be 129 graduates from the institution's programs, and they go to work in Russian factories. So it's a very, very small number, but you've got to begin somewhere, just like the very small number who go to the mathematical or the naval schools or the medical academies under Peter I. You've got to start somewhere. And that's what's going to happen under Nicholas. He's laying the foundation for developments that, that are really going to take off in the 1860s and the 1870s after he's gone from the scene, although he doesn't know this. So technical education is one area of important reform and expansion under Nicholas I. The other area of reform has to do with the periodical press. The number of journals and newspapers in Russia expands dramatically in the first half of the 19th century, although they are subject to those strict censorship laws that Nicholas introduces in 1826. Growth of the periodical press in the United States, in Britain, in France, is driven by what? Politics. Partially politics, because you've got newspapers and journals that are taking political lines. You've got a, a, a Republican, or not a Republican, we have Whigs and we have Democrats. So you've got newspapers that are going to tow political lines. But you don't just have uh, political newspapers. What drives the industry? Why do you decide? Who, who gets to decide if they want to establish a new newspaper or a journal? In Russia, the state has to sign off on that. Yeah, it's the market. Market factors are going to determine whether or not a publication is successful. If you think that there's a demand out there for a new journal on such and such a topic, you develop the capital, the wherewithal, you invest that, you establish a press, and you begin printing magazines and journals and hope they sell. The periodical press in Russia is going to be patronized by the state. State monies state direction, state initiative, leads to the expansion of the periodical press under Nicholas I. And the, the press journals, the press organs that emerge, are going to emphasize technical subjects. This is a process that begins under Alexander. It continues under Nicholas, his younger brother. The first of the new journals is something known as the technological journal. That tells you everything you need to know. It had been launched via decree during the reign of Alexander I. It was a quarterly publication from 1803 to 1820. And what the technical journal did is it published translations from foreign works, as well as a few original pieces by Russians on a wide range of subjects involving things like chemistry and agriculture and metallurgy, descriptions of the latest factory and production technologies that are being developed abroad. So you might have a story about the development of a Watt steam engine and its application to the textile. Thrilling reading, right? This is what you want to get up on a Sunday morning you know, or a Saturday morning and read about. Others are going to follow. In each instance, one of these is going to be sponsored by an individual state ministry. The Mining Journal is established in 1825. It's sponsored by the Finance Ministry. Journal of the Ways of Communication. Ways of communication, roads, and later uh, uh, railroads and telegraphs. That's going to be established by the transport ministry. Several new military journals emerge. The naval collection, the military collection, the artillery journal. Each one of these individual things is designed, is designed to promote the spread and the dissemination of technical and mechanical knowledge technical and mechanical knowledge that the state recognizes it needs to have in order to keep pace with rapidly unfolding technological and scientific events in the West. 1837 is going to see the establishment of something known as the Ministry of State Domains, sometimes translated as the Ministry of State Properties. And as the name suggests, this is a ministry that oversaw the administration and the the, uh, the use and the productive capacity of lands and properties owned directly by the autocratic state. The Ministry of State Domains is going to attempt as well uh, to raise the level of the uncivilized backward peasant masses across the Russian realm. 
One of its tasks is going to be expanding rural sanitation, trying to bring improved medical care, introducing modern agricultural practices. Why is that important? We just talked about the Norfolk system in the first half of the class. Improved agricultural production is the foundation, it's the bedrock of England's industrial revolution. How can you improve and make more efficient agricultural production in Russia? Well, that's one of the things the Ministry of State Domains is going to be uh, charged with doing. But, as is oftentimes the case, the peasants who encounter ministry officials grow to resent ministry officials' heavy-handed and oftentimes repressive intrusion into what the peasants consider to be their own lives apart from the state. The early 1840s is going to see a mass peasant uprising in opposition to one of the autocracy's initiatives. That's the introduction of potatoes. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. The introduction of potatoes. There's an effort that was made in the 1840s to introduce potato cultivation in the Russian lands as a way of providing a supplemental crop that could, you know, in times of famine for, for grain, ward off starvation. And the peasants resent this greatly. They do now, but they didn't then. The same reason, the same reason incidentally, or a similar reason incidentally, to why the British tenant farmers resented the introduction of turnips in the late 18th century. Turnips were used as fodder for animals, for horses. Potatoes were used as fodder for horses. The peasants equated the introduction of potatoes with the state trying to feed them animal food. And they, they, res they, resent, they resent this kind of treatment. It would be like, you know, instead of the government giving out free cheese, the government gives out puppy chow. What do you think would happen? People, ah, this is, you know, you know you're, you're treating us like animals. That's the way the peasants reacted to the introduction initially of potatoes. Now, potatoes, of course, in time, are going to become a very important staple in the Russian diet. And by the end of the 19th century, Potatoes do, in fact, help keep a lot of Russians alive uh, during times of, uh, of, of, of a poor harvest, poor grain harvest. Because potatoes, you can store potatoes relatively easily. You put them in a root, ba uh, root uh, basement or something like that, you can keep them for a while. You have uh, you know, as many as 500,000, a half million peasants are going to rise up in rebellion in the early 1840s over the introduction of the, known as the potato riots. Okay. Um, it was against this backdrop of simmering rural unrest because you know, the state's stepping in, it's trying to, in its paternalistic way, take care of the peasants. The peasants are rising up, they're like, oh my God, what the hell's going on? <laughs> Nicholas is going to order the formation of a series of secret committees between 1826 and 1847 to investigate the so-called peasant question. What are we going to do about the peasants? Well, specifically, what are we going to do about serfdom, the maintenance of serfdom? And by the time that these committees finally wind down, Nicholas is, 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 is himself willing to acknowledge, this is another quote from the autocrat, Nicholas will go so far as to acknowledge there is no doubt that serfdom in its present form is an evil obvious to all. But, he continues, to touch it now would of course be an even more ruinous evil. It is not as if the autocrat and members of his ministries are unaware of serfdom. They are very well aware of it. But they have a serious problem on their hands. How do you go about unraveling this system? Not coincidentally, because we're going to be using these two countries here as, as touchstones for the rest of the semester. I do this in the Soviet class as well. The United States in 1847 has something in its own peculiar institution. It's not served and it's chattel slavery. And that only ends after the, the nation's most bloody and divisive war, a war that's going to cost the lives of over half a million men. Okay. A terribly divisive civil war. That's what it's going to take for the United States to begin to unravel slavery. And even then, the problem facing blacks in the American South or anywhere else isn't fully resolved because you have the introduction of Reconstruction, that failure, Jim Crow, and things along those lines. You have institutionalized uh, racism and segregation that will continue uh, for decades and even generations afterwards. So the Russians, let's, let's, let's cut them some slack here. They're aware that there's a problem, but what do you do about it? 
that's going to come here in a couple of weeks. So the problem is going to be, uh, the, the solution is going to be forced upon them. <coughs> so it's not as if Nicholas I, despite his deserved reputation as being an obscurant and conservative, arch-conservative autocrat, it's not as if nothing changes under his reign. Expansion of, of technical education, the expansion of the periodical press, these are going to lay the foundations, really important foundations for Russia's later industrial takeoff. But Russia's industrial takeoff doesn't take place in the 1820s, the 1830s, even the 1840s or the 1850s. It's going to take a little bit longer. Let me give you another example of the ways in which Russia's effort to industrialize under Nicholas I sort of is stillborn. We talked about steamships last week. The example we're going to talk about this week is the case of railroads. I said, Two major transportation innovations during the age of industry. One is the steamship, the second is the railroad. Alexander I had tried to bring steamships to Russia and it failed largely. The reign of Nicholas I is going to see the first efforts to develop a rail network in the Russian Empire. And this is part of a general pattern of Russian technological development that we've already seen. The effort to bring railroads to Russia takes place relatively quickly after the emergence of the first rail line in Great Britain. That Liverpool-Manchester line is established in 1830. Within four years, within four years, you have a proposal brought before Nicholas I's government to establish railroads in Russia. The individual who brings this proposal is this man, Franz Anton von Gerstner an Austrian engineer who is recognized already in the 1830s as Europe's leading authority on railroad construction. He studied the process very, very carefully. Later in his career, he is going to be dispatched to the United States of America by none other than Nicholas's government. And he's going to be asked to study how exactly the Americans are doing so well constructing their rail network. That rail network that I had told you by 1840 has already got 30,000 miles of track. What are they doing and how can we replicate their success? Gerstner arrives in Russia in 1834 with a proposal to construct a short railroad between the capital of St. Petersburg and the imperial summer residence in the city's suburb of Tsovskia Silo. Which translates roughly into the Tsar's village. Tsar's village, Tsovskia Silo. It's located about 17 miles outside of St. Petersburg. 17 mile railroad. That doesn't seem very long. How long was that River Pool Manchester Railroad? 35 miles. 35 miles. So we're not talking about thousands of miles of track. Four years after the 35-mile uh, British Liverpool-Manchester rail line is opened, Gerstner says, let's build a 17-mile railroad from the capital of the Tsar's Summer Palace. And what he intends is this to be a proof of concept. He wants to demonstrate to the Russian court and to Russian state officials that this is possible. And he wants to do so with the idea in mind that if he demonstrates the proof of concept, then he can secure a subsequent privilege from the state to build more railroads in Russia, including the obvious one that needs to be built from St. Petersburg to Moscow. From the outset, Gerstner confronts considerable opposition from members of the bureaucracy. Bureau conservative bureaucrats argue that this is going to cost an exorbitant amount of money. Some, are, some argue that the rail networks, once they're built, will only serve to facilitate the arrival of revolutionary ideas. The movement of peoples across the empire is not something you necessarily want. We see that in Western Europe where people are moving hither and yon wherever they want to, spreading ideas, spreading revolutionary sentiment. We want to avoid that. The Minister of Finance under Nicholas I, a fellow by the name of Kankren, openly warns that any profit that would go from building and operating these rail lines is going to end up in the pockets of foreigners. The peasants, the peasants who had long made their livelihoods transporting goods 
We talked about that last week, remember, or barge haulers? Well, if you build railroads, what happens to them? They'll be out of jobs. We don't want to have these railroads here because the burlaki, the, the, the haulers on the roads are, are going to lose their gainful employment. And besides, in the process of building the railroads and operating them, you are going to ruin Russia's forests because you don't have sufficient coal. Coal deposits haven't been discovered yet in the Donbass region. That, that's coming. So you're going to have to burn wood to fire the steam engines. Others are going to go so far as to argue that it's just impractical. You're not going to be able to operate locomotives in Russia's harsh climate. Some theorize the trains simply aren't going to be able to operate except the period April through November, because once the heavy snows come, everything's going to shut down, so it's a waste of money. Opponents go so far uh, in, 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 in trying to prevent Gerstner's proposal from being accepted that they actually begin launching public attacks in this newly emerging periodical press that's been patronized by state ministries. One article that's published in autumn of 1835 disparages Gerstner's scheme uh, to build railroads across the empire's great expanse, calling it, quote, completely impossible, clearly useless, and highly unprofitable. The article had been planted, or at least supported, by the head of the Russian secret police. So you've got ministry officials working behind the scenes surreptitiously to undermine Gerstner, who's brought this proposal forward to the government. So why does it go through? And it does succeed. It goes through in no small part because Nicholas I intervenes. We've talked about this before. The state is the principal initiator, the principal agent of modernization. Here is an example, once again, just like Peter, like Ivan IV, Ivan III, Nicholas I is going to intervene. He is interested in Gerstner's proposal because he recognizes its potential military use. And he believes this is something that Russia needs to try. He believes that the railroad has military potential in, in transporting troops, but he's reluctant to invest scarce state funds in what is going to be a speculative enterprise. Gerstner is going to try and secure financial backing from a small number of very wealthy Russian and European investors. Once he is able to raise about three and a half million dollars, or five dollars, three and a half million rubles, only then does Nicholas give him permission to form a private joint stock company to raise the funds necessary to build the railroad. So, so Gerstner's got to raise the money. He secures, he secures support from some uh, wealthy investors. He raises an initial amount of capital. Having raised the capital, Nicholas says, okay, you can form a joint stock company to raise more. The rail line is going to open formally on the 30th of October, 1837. A year later than Gerstner promised and significantly over budget. So it takes longer to build than he estimated, and it costs more. That's another continuing theme in Russian technological history. Why does it cost more? In part, because there's only one Russian factory capable of producing components. One. And they demand excessively high prices. So Gerstner has to turn abroad for almost everything. And that's going to raise the cost of construction because of all the transport problems we've already discussed. Part of it has to do, perhaps, with them not wanting it there. A lot of it has to do with they just don't really have the technical skill and it's going to take time to convert machine tools over to the production process. They're less familiar with it. Mistakes are going to be made. It's going to drag out the production process. Foreign engineers are going to be relied upon to, to provide the technical expertise. This sound familiar? This is, this is the Russian pattern of development. Turn abroad for the technical expertise, the materials you need to begin investing. The thing ends up costing about five and a half million dollars. It was budgeted at three and a half million. It costs five and a half million. You have almost a, a sixty to seventy to eighty percent cost overrun. Nicholas the first, nevertheless, insists on seeing the project through because he believes it's going to be more embarrassing to the government to have the project fail than to have it simply cost too much. <coughs> 
But in all honesty, in this respect, Russia's experience isn't that much different from countries like even the United States, where government intervention is required to underwrite the incredible capital costs of railroad construction into the 1850s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. So the government's going to step in, it's going to claim eminent domain, seize private land, give it over to the railroads, guarantee the railroad's profit as a way of getting this, uh, it, this uh, transportation infrastructure up and running. And the problem that Gerstner has is that once in business, the day-to-day -day operation of the rail line proves to be more expensive as well. And here he has again the problem of not being able to call upon domestic producers for parts, not being able to call upon domestic providers for essential services. The only Russian factory capable of making axles and wheels demanded twice as much as European manufacturers. So foreigners are going to drive the engines, foreign mechanics are going to oversee the, oversee the repairs. The greatest expense, the greatest expense is going to come from the need to import coke. Coke. Coke is a form of bituminous coal that has been baked at high temperatures to harden so that when it's fired, it burns at a higher temperature and for a longer period. Coke is, in short, for all, all we need to know about coke today is that it is a much more efficient fuel source for powering steam engines. It's, in fact, it's the, fa it's, it's the favorite source uh, of, of energy for, uh, for steam engines and for blast furnaces because, again, it produces higher temperatures for longer periods with greater energy, less smoke and ash. Russia is not going to have any factory that produces coke uh, until very, very late in the 19th century. The reason for this is simple. There's a lot of wood, and as a result of there being a lot of wood in Russia, there's a lot of charcoal. As late as, 18, as, late as the 1880s, only 6% of Russian iron is going to be produced using coke a time by which virtually all American, all British, all Prussian uh, metallurgy is being undertaken using coke. So the Russians are going to use this cheaper. We've seen an example of this already as well, and that would be the slow transition for Russian cannon casting from iron to bronze because of the exorbitant costs of bronze manufacturing and at the time, Russia's absence of copper deposits to make that possible, they rely upon this existing cheaper method. It's not as efficient but it gets the job done. Yes, ma'am. Are these trains, like the cabs, are they also made out of wood? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a wooden cab. That's wood. The iron, obviously, uh, for the engine that's driving it, but they're wooden, mostly open carriages. Later, they're going to be enclosed. And still later, much, much later, they're going to be made out of iron or steel, they aluminum and, and things along those lines. So what, but, uh, in, in, where was I here? Very quickly, because I'm running out of time. Um, this ends up, however, being the extent of Russia's railroad development for about the next uh, 15 to 20 years. Okay. Uh, running the railroad at a steady profit, running it at a steady rate, proves to be a little bit difficult. Russia's going to be beset by a series of, of internal challenges when we get to that. Uh, the problem, the, the real problem that Russia faces expanding on its rail network and anything resembling the British or the American model is a lack of state capital. It's that surplus scarcity once again that's going to retard Russia's technological development because the state simply cannot amass the funds necessary for this major investment in transportation infrastructure. Russia's, there will be a, a small Russian rail boom in the 1850s and the 1860s. We will talk later in the semester, for the end of the semester, about the great Russian railroad building uh, campaign, but that doesn't take place until the 1880s and the 1890s, considerably later than, say, America's, which is in the 1860s, much later than the British, which are up and running already by the 1830s and the 1840s. Herein then lies the lesson of, of the first half of Nicholas's reign. We're going to talk more about this in the weeks to come. Imperial Russia's experience with the outset of industrial development in the early 19th century really did resemble patterns established earlier in the country's history. As had been true under Peter and his Muscovite predecessors, foreigners would prove critical to the country's modernization. Men like Gerstner and others whom we will meet 
uh, Charles Baird from last week, the Scotsman who tries to establish the steamboat service between St. Petersburg and Kronstadt. They supply the capital and expertise, imported machinery, they built the factories, they trained Russian technicians and workers, and they managed the steady, if slow, expansion of leading enterprises. The state continues to serve as the principal instigator of development, but it's doing so to promote military and economic interests, not consumer culture, not consumer culture. Russia's early industrial development would be understandably haphazard and it would be woefully complete. And it's the inability of Russia to take advantage of these new technologies that is, that is going to find it falling further and further behind from the standpoint of technological development, its competitors in the West. And what this is going to end up producing, we're going to find out here in, in a week or so, is it's going to open up a technological gap. A technological gap that is going to have dramatic repercussions on Russia's military preparedness. So that although Peter's reforms enable the Russians to emerge at the forefront of European politics as a result of the liberation of Russia by the, by the peasant armies in 1815, already by 1845-1850, Russia's development having reached a plateau and stopped, the Russians find themselves being outstripped by the Western Europeans. They now have to come up having undertaken all those efforts to modernize under Peter and his successors are going to have to begin another long process of modernization with the idea of catching up to the West because the West is now caught up in this process of industrialization. Industrialization process, it's not going to reach full fruition in Russia until the end of the 19th century. But that is as yet before us this semester. Come on back next week. We're going to talk about the rise of the Russian discontented classic. We'll move on from there. New discussion of military affairs in the middle of the 19th century.